Kat DeLorean joins the Warriors. Kat says that she has lived a loud life. And, you know, I want to read something. I want to get it very correct here um, about you, Kat. And here's what I'm going to read. I don't like reading, but I want to be perfect with you. Uh, Kat DeLorean, a proud mother of three, a wife, a mentor, and a daughter of automotive magnet John Z. DeLorean. She leads DeLorean Next Generation Motors, which is dedicated to creating a brighter future for the next generation of past passion-driven change makers. I like that so much, Kat. All right, she has an extensive background in cybersecurity at a major financial institution where she served in leadership and, mem and mentorship roles for the last 20 years. In this new chapter in her life, Kat is eager to recruit the best minds across, I'm going to just say across industries. And I'm adding, I'm adding a little bit to this cat, you know, um, I'm, what I'm adding is, you know, I like to focus on, I'm, I'm so excited. I have so much to say to you, you know, your role with our vulnerable youth kind of thing. Um, but I just want to say, I'm just going to leave that. I'm not going to read anymore. Your, your mission with DeLorean Next Generation is a shining example of warrior work. So I, look, I'm your biggest cheerleader. I want to share this. And I want to hear all about what you and your husband, Jason, are doing together and your travels uh, and how you've launched DeLorean Next Generation. It's a nonprofit company. It's an education program you have going on for high schoolers, which is what I love. And, you know, we have to just keep talking about this positive type of work that is needed because I believe it can snowball then across our entire country. So I want everybody go to that website, brush up on it, get involved, see how you can help. Again, it's a nonprofit. The website is DeLoreanNextGen.com. Enough of my voice, Kat. It's time to talk to you. Welcome to Lynn's Warriors. Thank you very much for having me. Before we begin, I want to clarify. Mm -hmm. So DeLorean Next Generation itself is a not-for-profit. Everything okay. made in DeLorean Next Generation goes back into the program and the the not necessarily the company because the company is the program. Um, DeLorean Legacy Project is our nonprofit entity that manages the donations, the, the legacy, the education program, and the pieces like that. Um, it's it's done this way because in order to run a nonprofit car company, you would almost have to have a board meeting for every single component on the car. Um, so in yes. so yeah, <laughs> so so we've created uh, um, if if you would think we've created two entities in order to be able to achieve this because I started with the nonprofit. This all began when I was building an automotive engineering program in one building in one small town in New Hampshire to give back to this town that I love, and it snowballed into something. Everybody said, "Wow, we need this. We want this." Uh, I joke that if you're a DeLorean and you try and build one car, you end up with a car company because that's actually what happened to my dad, who was building a concept car for Allstate Insurance that turned into the DeLorean. <laughs> So um, really, we, we, we saw such a need and everybody was so excited saying, oh, my gosh, hope. And so we said, well, let's try. But I didn't want to build a car. I really didn't. I, I, I told people, I said, that didn't end well for my dad. I'm not in the business of making cars. But he touched so many people in the automotive industry. He inspired and helped and, and just he touched so many lives across so many industries. I had people who basically said, let us build the car and we'll fund your program. So I found a group of, of individuals who really were passionate about honoring my father with a car mm -hmm. and they were willing to build it for my program. So in order to make this um, work, we designed m multiple companies to actually break it down so that we can keep the two separate. Um, my focus is on building out the education program and we have, you know, I'm involved in the car build because it is my father's car. It is in honor of him. So I have to be. But my, my main focus is building out what we give back to the kids and how we bring this next level of what I call STEAM education, which is science, technology, um, engineering, uh, automotive arts, mathematics and manufacturing. So we've added a couple of extra letters and uh I get to focus on that because they build the cars. So it's important to note 
that we are not for profit when it's DeLorean Next Gen Motors, but DeLorean Legacy Profit uh, Project is a nonprofit. Um, and that's because our- I, I think I get it. I think I get it. Big. Huge dreams. We want to change the world. We just don't want to build a car. We don't want to just educate some kids. We want to ch educate any kid. We want to build dream pathways. So you dream I big. Think, you know, I think, Kat, that's why, uh, you know, when I started coming across you, like on Instagram and your, you know, it was like infectious things you were just writing. And I started, you know, I grew up in Jersey, so there's a little bit of a connection there, you know, and I started saying, wow, like she's a really good writer. I like what she's writing. And wow, she's also like opening the door to her dad, you know, and then I'm telling you, like I kind of started reading up and I was so impressed between what you were writing and some things I found on my own, the, the impact he made on people, you know, like the employees and things like that something and let me just be honest like i i never you know really read much about that or anything like that that kind of impact and to me i'm always about community creates change like you mm -hmm. know it starts in the home in the community that's like my whole thing like mm -hmm. i just don't understand cat like it, like why people can't think like that but that's a whole nother program you know because to me that's where you go to affect this change mm -hmm. yeah and so, you know, when I saw what you were doing, I was like, this is really something. And this is something that can succeed. And I'm so glad you say STEAM. I was um, saying STEAM for a long time, but without the double A's, because I was always including arts. I'll yes. tell you why, because we have so many studies that prove a child, a young person, anybody can benefit when they have arts in their lot, you know, life, whether it's truly, you know, I don't know, painting, singing, any of this stuff it helps you in all other areas, mathematics, everywhere. So I was always like pushing, no, it's not just STEM, it's yes. STEAM. And so now I'm calling it STEAM double A, adding you know, <laughs> automotive arts or, or automotive and arts or something like that. I find that um, fascinating. Let me ask you, um, let's jump right in. So last time we spoke a couple of months ago, you were embarking, you were leaving mm -hmm. for, I believe, Detroit. Mm -hmm. Now, Phyllis, and you were very excited about that. You were leaving with your husband, Jason, what uh, transpired? Give us give us the landscape of what happened. Be truthful. I know you will be. <laughs> and how did the kids? How did the kids like react? Because I'll tell you, Kat, there's so much noise, so much talk, chatter, you know, across our country and world. It doesn't trickle down again, like into communities. In my opinion, like that hands-on kind of approach. So tell us all about the trip. Before I tell you about the trip what you described that it all begins at home is what inspired this. Um, the way that I phrase it is in complex systems, like we live in society, real change doesn't happen at the top. The top has a vested interest in the equilibrium there at the top. So it really bubbles up from the bottom. The only way to create true impactful change is from the community efforts. So, so that's kind of what drives it. We can't change everything. It's all broken we can change the life for one person at a time. And then that will propagate to them helping change another person's life. We we want it to be a pay it forward walk. We want to lead by example. So that's the basis of everything that we're doing. With that said, Detroit was phenomenal. I'll start by saying the best night that I can tell you about when we were there, we finished, I think our first day uh, with the students. And I was lying in bed with Jason, hysterical crying, saying, this is how money buys happiness. Oh, <laughs> because, boy, yeah. yes, because our first group of students were two different schools that were alternative high schools in Detroit. Mm. And I, this is, these are the children that society deems aren't even worthy anymore. We're just going to put you in these schools because you're, you're not able for whatever reason for, and, and, and it's not the children's faults, right? It's always the circumstances that lead to where, so we had these girls, we had these girls, I'm going to cry just thinking about it. We had these girls who were there and they'd never experienced anything like that. They'd mm. never participated in anything like that. They had no idea that they could not only learn that way, but be lifted up that way. Yes. And 
um, to be in such a supportive environment for them. And there was one girl who tragically, it's been taking a long time to get to get it together for her, but I finally told Miles, we have to go nuclear. She's my one. Um, this one girl, she never driven a car before and she kicked my butt on all the times on the simulator. Never driven a car before. Wow. And and I said, You're amazing. You should, you know, come try out for our all-female race team when we build it. And she stopped and looked up at me. And she said, I can do that. Wow. And I said, I said, Yes. And now she wants to be a NASCAR driver. And so we're looking for sponsors for her to help get her um, access to her simulators and everything she needs. Because she comes from an alternative high school in Detroit. She doesn't have a lot of resources available to her. Um, but it was this moment where you realize that it is just about letting them know it. it you can. Yes. There is nothing that you can't do. There is no job off limits to you. Yes there are challenges with how to get the resources and access to the things that let you be able to do those jobs. And that's what we're here to fulfill. I want to build pathways to dreams. I'm starting with automotive because that's what we were doing. That's where I am right now. But eventually we want to build it out to any dream yeah. pathway. Any kid who wants to go into art or fashion yes. or engineering or design and to also allow us to build a collection of people who can help them understand you're not limited at by uh your your skill set so um there i spoke to somebody who runs a uh, a mentorship program and she said I, i'm i'm having a hard time with these students who are failing to see a direction for their uh, IT degree. They they can do anything. And so that's a problem for them. They're like this lawyer, they know what they're going to do. And my doctor friend knows what they're going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. And I said, well, you have to approach them by telling them it's not about choosing a profession that fits your skill set. You literally now have a skill set that can choose any passion you want. If you love cars and you are an, an attorney, go be an attorney for an automotive company. You can right. do these things. And it's funny how little people actually can think about that very common sense thing. But we are we become so focused on what we're doing. We, we get that tunnel vision. So part of what our program is as well is just expanding the mm. awareness of what's out there. And then providing access to the different vendors and um, providers of these services and these programs. And so um, Detroit was phenomenally successful, if only for reaching the one child. But we happen to reach many. Um, we, unle we unveiled the clay model of our car. We worked yeah. on, uh, we were going to show up with a prototype and, and unveil it at the auto show. And I had decided that I w what we were working towards was impacting the experience I wanted to provide for the kids. So we decided this year we would launch with our clay model and come back next year with the prototype. And we had the students at Drive One, which is a high school automotive design program, um, create our clay model. And it I, one of the students cried because they were able to be able to be part of this experience. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to create the meaningful opportunities and experiences for these kids to have something that will allow, will drive them and will allow them to see what they want to do. Um, while we were there, we were able to visit the Pontiac Transportation Museum and um, start to build some relationships in Pontiac, Michigan. And it looks as though Pontiac, Michigan is going to be our first pilot program uh, along with Anderson, Indiana. But with Anderson, we're building out the STEAM component. And uh, with the Pontiac School District, we have, we have some existing curricula that can go into this district. And so we're going to be building one while we are learning all the challenges we'll face implementing in this district. Um, the fact that it's Pontiac is, there are no words that that happened. I mean, I'm over the moon. <laughs> yeah. 
Do you um, think? Do you think it's like? I don't know. Out like was out there in the universe. You know what I'm saying? Like hmm. this is because you know I go in that direction. But I'm just asking you. It seems yeah. like this is just meant to be, kind of yes. like, and that you must, you have to do all of this, and yes. that this really will just uh, explode. And I think. Again, I you know, I, I didn't know your dad or anything. Can you imagine like how proud? Seriously, can I say that to you? Like, I'm I'm proud of you. <laughs> no, no, but I mean, because Kat, you touched on a couple of things that I'm every day working with human trafficking, as you know I do, and I'm working, you know, all forms of like sexual exploitation with our youth. And all they need is that hand on the shoulder kind of thing. And it yeah. sounds so simple. Mm -hmm. But that's what they need, you know, whether you want to call that mentorship or just like cheerleading or supportive. Because when you said, you know, like when she said to you, that young woman, like, you mean I can do that? Like, I, mm -hmm. like that's the reaction I get a lot. But they're so mm -hmm. stuck and so vulnerable or can't get out of this horror they're stuck in or they're just so busy existing every day. Mm -hmm. And when you said, you know, starting big, you have to start big. You got to start up there. No, that's like, seriously, what I always say that we're very similar in things we say, like, no, you start, that's where you start, like way up there that at the top, you, that's where you go. But I love that you said, you know, this is what we need to also teach other people to give, mm -hmm. give this back a little bit. Again, it's that hand on the shoulder type of thing. Yes, you can do it. Yes, you're worthy. Yes. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, you're going that step further. Here's the pathway. Because, of course, the next step is always money, resources. What do we do? <laughs> right? Human trafficking. It's always like, how do we get people out of the situations? We don't have homes for them. Right? Mm -hmm. We don't have programs to give them job training, mm -hmm. you know, to match up with companies, like something we're working towards as well. Because they want to make money. They want to feel useful. Right? Mm -hmm. And I love the idea also of... Um, I just read a study, but you know, I don't really believe things cat unless I wrote it myself or maybe my husband wrote it. Cause I just, <laughs> I don't believe a lot of things in the media. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just don't. And uh, every day I see things, whether on television or online that are just not true. They're outright lies. I'll just say propaganda. So I, I love the idea of, you know, not everybody I was reading up to 40% of colleges now are considering Degrees are no longer going to be, we've seen the direction of this, worth anything, right? You know, why spend all this money on college? Now we can look at that two different ways. But for now, I've always said, like, not all kids are geared for you know, academics. It's not that one size fits all that kids hate in middle school and high school and parents force them to go to colleges. They, like kids need, I was always like to my husband, we need more plumbers. We need carpenters. Mm -hmm. Like we need, yes. we, need, we need to train that and not just, you know, this, trade school to like really make that like an exciting that's mm -hmm. just equally as good as all this pressure that's put on and going or was put on i'm not sure what's happening these days you know with going to college type thing so i think you know to get kids involved in automotive like you pointed out there's so many different ways maybe they want to be a lawyer as you pointed out you know mm -hmm. but they, you know, they can go in that like it's a wheel it's like the i call it the wheel with a lot of spokes like the same for human trafficking there's so many different areas um to work in. So that almost makes me cry when you describe like, no, but when a young woman can say like, you know, I can, I can, or I could do that, mm -hmm. like to come and we need more women, Kat, where are all the women? <laughs> uh, that's probably another program too, but like I'm in the middle of New York city, everybody's flapping their lips about everything, disruption all around, you know, but not this, they should be disrupting these important things and empowering, you know, mm -hmm. our youth. And they're, they're not doing it around me because I'm involved in a lot of stuff and they don't, and I know, don't give me that argument. They're overwhelmed and don't have the time. No, we're all, we're all overwhelmed. We're all tired. Yeah, we all, we all have families. You're making it happen. I make it happen on my own level. Everybody, I think we live in a society now. Everybody has to participate. They cannot sit on the sidelines and they have to give back in some way, and everybody can do something. What do you think about that? 
Oh, I believe that that's the most important part about healing our society is finding the little thing you can do each day that makes a difference. You don't have to go build a car company that shouldn't change the world. You can actually smile at a stranger who's yes. then going to have a better day and then maybe go home and invent a car company that will change the world, right? We don't know how our small actions impact the entirety of our planet. And we should always seek to put out positive impact in the actions that we take. I believe though, a lot of the challenge, so I grew up in IT in, uh, in, in corporate America. And I was the first girl on every team I was on. The first oh. server engineer, the first female red teamer, the first female on the hunt team. I was the first female always because it was a male dominated field. And there's a lot going on in situations like that. I think that it becomes hard for us as women because of just society um, to really find our way to really embrace who we are and find a comfortable place to exist so that we feel empowered to do what we do. And then also to be able to have the strength to just not. You can't take anything personally. You have to understand that it's them, not you. Anybody who's rude to you or treats you a certain way, they have their own stuff going on. And if we bother to internalize it, that can really take us down a road, especially in the nature aspect of who we are. We are naturally born to care for others and to care about others um, in a way that allows us to be mothers and caretakers. So we can't just ignore nature. We also can't... Um, uh, internalize other people's issues mm -hmm. and once you're able to kind of get past that and and empower yourself to say this situation is not me it's you so I'm going to go over here I'm actually just going to change my job because I'm not going to change you and you make me not want to come to work and it doesn't even have to be a manager it can be somebody you work with take yourself out of that situation empower yourself to feel um, in control of how happy you are to spend your eight hours a day at work and then on top of that, don't try and fit into what is defined as a corporate um, definition of what works. First of all, I was a senior leader, which is a junior executive at, tw at 32 years, some young age with purple hair. I worked from home at the time. And then I went to our executive um, in person. And this was this was like 2009. This was not a time when anybody had purple hair. And I was a senior leader at Bank of America. We had to go to a round table with all the senior executives. And I asked my manager, who was a senior executive, should I dye my hair before I come in? Nobody's seen me to this point, doesn't matter. And he says, no, you're my rock star. If they have a problem with your hair, they can talk to me. And that empowered me to say, I get to be who I am as long as I do a good job. And I had a really great manager who supported me that way. Yeah, and I learned... Yep. And I learned a way to balance that. And the other thing I learned to do was to embrace my femininity in my leadership style. I was able to get my team to come and talk to me open and honestly about what they felt was a problem in the team because of society and nature. And it's easier to talk to mom who's opening up this conversation than it is to a man who feels emasculated by having the team come and tell him what he's doing wrong and that right or wrong or however that is that can be something that hinders the ability i've had many for the record i've had many male managers who navigated that very well but you know when you come into just just some of the things that are wrong with how we teach people to think is is where i'm going and so a lot of times women trying to fit into the box that's worked for their male counterparts and that's where you end up with bitch boss or this and all of these memes and things that come along with it no Embrace the fact that people like what is different about being a woman in leadership and what strengths you have that are different. We all fit in this great wheel of the universe differently. And we need to find our place instead of trying to step into somebody else's. And I think when more women are able to be in an environment where they are empowered, where they are supported and where they have an environment of growth and support like that, which I had at my financial institution in a way I could never describe from day one till the day I retired, it was an incredible opportunity for me to grow in strength that way. 
which is what I believe my father also had at General Motors, um, given what I've read and learned about that time he had there. So I think that's why there aren't more women. I think that we need to really not get angry, get smart and empowered and stop giving everybody else power over us. Everybody you let bother you because they're a jerk. They have space in your brain. I they're, was just going to say that. They're, they're like living free in your brain, free yeah. real estate in your brain. And uh -uh. I'll give them that power. No, just ignore them. It works very well. And newsflash, it actually angers them more than reacting. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, but but yeah. my cat, here's the thing. I think that is the most important uh, message. I, I'm very happy that you had that support as a woman because I started in the music business decades ago. And there was no room for women other than like, you know, you, I don't even have to explain what it was. And so <clears throat> you know, I, I, that was just the way it was. There was no, as I say, finagling around to try to exert oneself. It just, it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. It just, but the sad part in retrospect, of course, now I can look back, like we went along with it sort of, do you know yes. what I'm saying? Like we didn't. Yes we didn't in the late seventies, early eighties, like fight back or we, we, we didn't even talk about it. It was just like, this is the way it goes um, kind of thing. So I'm happy you had that sort of uh, empowerment around you. And frankly, I'm glad you had the purple hair and I'm glad he didn't tell you to like dye it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because I'd be very disappointed in you. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, no, but I mean, that is, that is fantastic. And I think this is the message. This is what I, I and I know you do too. We have to teach our young women. Mm -hmm. We have to teach this message. Yes, you can power in numbers, you know, make your voice appropriately heard, like be honest and open. I'm very concerned cat about, I don't know, starting in like even fifth, sixth grade now going mm -hmm. back because the kids, the kids are now, I mean, in my day we had uh, like, middle school type of thing. I don't know. They go from like fourth grade now to high school age. They just, yeah. have, yes. of course, the internet has fueled everything in my opinion. So they know and they see everything. And obviously what's going on in our country and around the world, they're seeing everything. That message of, um, again, it's that cheerleading message. It's that hand on the shoulder, in my opinion. It's yes, you can, or, you know, you don't have to go on OnlyFans and lift your top up for $5. Mm -hmm. see, this is what I fight a lot. You know, if somebody, a young woman can do that, I'm talking 12, 13, 14 years old and make a few bucks, why are they going to want to go be a clerk in a store, you know, or, or like work as a waitress? Like we have to empower, at least I think along this journey, like you are worth so much more than that. Mm -hmm. Like and that's, well, that's one of the obstacles I have now. So I, that's why I think this whole automotive, it's like this to me, to me, an untapped kind of like field that you can like control the whole thing and be the forefront at, and it will just be like this global sensation and we'll get all these young women. And, and you know, I hope, some I guys, hope. But, you know, you know, but, but tell me like thoughts on that. Cause I, I, I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it right now as I talk to you. I'm well, seeing it. so, so I think a part of the issue about the five, making the $5 instead of going to work in a clerk is there aren't like everybody, the people who work, once upon a time, we had entry level jobs into the job market. These yes. jobs were never designed to support people for their lives. And now we expect people to live them. There's a whole lot that goes into it by not in increasing minimum wage, not to get into that discussion, but by not increasing minimum wage, you also don't increase median wage. So that's kind of where middle class went. So now you have a bunch of people who used to be, you used to have a, a possibility of doing something you dreamt of. It was more of something that was attainable than it is today. Today, you have to work to survive. And yeah. sometimes you have to work to three jobs just to survive when you didn't have to do it that way before. So what this has done, regardless of why or that whole problem and whatever it is, it is the core of what's happened to our youth. We had a formula that was available. You go to school. You get a part-time or entry-level job, you get a real job, you save your money, you retire, you have a happy life in retirement. You buy a house, you have kids, you retire. They can't even buy a car, let alone a house. 
They can't. What is this formula we gave them that no longer works? And then we're not saying, okay, here's the new one. Here's how you do what we said right. before. They're watching everything fall apart around them. And their parents have gone through multiple financial crises now in our in, in the world. And mm -hmm. we're facing another one. So why? What hope do they have? And 33% of all of our youth are hopeless. And so if I could just go out and feed my addiction of dopamine in any way by buying things, by feeling acknowledged, even the adrenaline of taking your top off on the internet, these, these are drugs that are being fed by a lack of direction. Um, not that there's anything wrong with, there are some people who really enjoy being sex workers more power to them though those people i fully support them like loving their body and loving what they do the problem comes in like you said this is always an easy way to feed yourself and we have a lot of people who are actually doing it because they have to and that regardless of the ones who are doing it and the ones that you rescue it we need to give people a new yeah. formula yeah, we need to. And so that's kind of what we're trying to do is create something incredibly unique. And I'm in a place where I can do this. There aren't very many people who come with the background, the pedigree, the name, the brand, all of these things come into play. And so I could either go make a billion dollar car company or I could do what I want to do and compete with everybody else. And that would actually be very difficult. Um, but instead, what I want to do, I've lived that life. And I legitimately just want to go live in a conversion van and meet people and, and experience different places and people. I don't need much for that, right? Um, so I have this opportunity to create something that asks nobody else to change the way they do what they're doing. I'm not here to disrupt their right. system. I'm here to create something that feeds their system, that gives them better workers, happier employees, more stable individuals, and create a pathway to dreams without disrupting anything by helping everybody. Because in the end, we'll have help the, the automotive industry by creating more factories, more skilled workers, and so it's a unique place that we're in. And the only thing I can do is recognize the blessing that it is, how special it is, and that I have to do it. Like you said, it yeah. feels like this is what was meant to be. Too many things are just perfect. Even the timing, even the timing for it to be happening at a time when we all need just a little bit of hope, right? And I, I think the timing's perfect because I, my poor husband, I'm constantly like saying the pendulum is ever so slightly swinging back because people can't take this again, is my opinion, what is going on. I even compare it to here in New York, we had the big Christmas tree lighting last mm -hmm. night, you know, Rockefeller Center. And of course, because I don't like to talk about things unless I actually watch them or, or you know, <laughs> so I can have my own opinion or whatever. And I thought to myself, this doesn't matter what you think of the people like Barry Manilow or Cher or Darlene Love, who 84 years old, I worked with her on a show on Broadway. Uh, she was in the show Hairspray and I worked on that show as a producer. And I'm like, wow, they're, they're bringing out like, you know, uh, they had a commercial for Capital One with John Travolta, you know, with like the BG soundtrack. And I'm like, wow, I'm right. They're swinging back. Like, I think people are now like kind of craving like nostalgia or to get back, you know, they want new, they want new, they can't handle, who can handle any of this? I think mm -hmm. you are, I think you're so positioned and I don't even have to tell you this because you said it to open this up. You're offering something new because mm -hmm. I, I'm really not seeing this around. Okay. No. I'm not seeing, I'm working very hard on my end to try to pair up, you know, victims, survivors of the mm -hmm. trafficking for job training and the companies, frankly, and I won't name them, they're not really coming through. There's a couple of companies, but they're not doing it appropriately. You know, mm -hmm. they're not training people appropriately. They're not invested. The passion's not there. You have passion yeah. about all of this. You know, I think it's the universe is yours uh, for the taking. I, I absolutely do. I have, I have two questions. Answer however you see fit. When you say your name to somebody, how do they react to you? 
I don't huh. know. Just say you're like, I don't know, in some store and like you have to give your name or I don't know, you're on customer service. Do they ask you questions ever? Yeah. So I I actually, ch I, I took my husband's name when we got married. I asked him to take my name and he was like, no, no, I don't want to do that to my dad. Something like that. Um, he is going to take my name now. We are going to get remarried and have a ceremony. It's a long story. We'll talk about that later. But is that, um, is that legal? Can one do that? You can just switch names? Well, we're going to have a, yeah, why not? It's my name. Like it's as long as I'm not doing it to run from anybody. So we're going to, I've always wanted to get married, have my wedding at 20 years. We were a little busy this year. It's, it's coming up in January. So I said to Jason, I said, you have one year to propose and plan my wedding because we're getting married next January. <laughs> and, um, and I asked him to take my name so that this time we make it something official. So we'll just have to go. Th it's not fun to do that. But um, I started going by Seymour specifically for that reason, uh, partially for security reasons, but also because when I would call for my power, I'd have to get into a 10 minute conversation about how my dad wasn't in jail. It was, it was constant. But what was more than that was people assumed I had things I didn't. I was a single mom working as an intern, making my own money. I wasn't a trust fund kid. I, I was for like five minutes and then it only paid for my schooling in New York. Like that was it. That's um, it. So when I was out on my own and starting on my own, I was on my own. I was clipping coupons and I had to do like, just like everybody else. <laughs> I had a great leg up on life, but when I turned 20 something, then it became yeah. pretty normal. And people would assume that I was a spoiled brat without talking to me, without knowing. I was leaving work one day and my manager said to me, oh, it must be nice that daddy bought you that car. I was getting into my Trans Am. I was so proud. It was the first car I bought with my own money. I bought it with modeling money that I had made. And I was so proud of this car. It was the first car I bought with my own money. And here she's just like, my manager is telling me this. And so I had people who would treat me differently just because they assumed I was a rich brat and I just wasn't, <laughs> you didn't even know me. So. And exhausting. You have to keep I, rehashing it. And Kat, you didn't, and we know it like in retrospect, like we don't owe anybody. You didn't owe anybody an explanation about anything no. <laughs> about your life. Right. Like, you know, even if your car came from, as an example, you don't owe anybody like that's your car. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why do people, no, people, people are so invasive. They ask such invasive questions. They, they, we tend to try and find fault in people we are jealous of, I believe. Mm. Um, I, at the time was, you know, I'm almost six feet up, five foot 11. I was just finished modeling. So I was statuesque and young and oh, so they're, jealous. Was, they're all jealous. They're mean yeah. girls. Okay. <laughs> yeah. She actually said in my interview that she didn't want to hire me because I was tall and beautiful, which was weird. Yeah. So, so I weird. mean, it, it sure had something to do with that. I did. I mean, I, see, I don't that's, know. Well, that's something I, I, you know, you had a good experience with managers and stuff in IT. My worst enemies have been other women along the yeah. years. Not, and I think that's another thing, you know, we have to teach our girls as well which is I'm uh, why I'm so concerned about the internet fueling, you know, the youth mental health crisis, eating disorders. We got it all going on on the internet for young women, for girls. You know, uh, um, we have to s truly support each other. I know for decades now it's women's empowerment and we're sisters and we're, I'm telling you, I haven't experienced it. And I'm like the bit, I'm sorry, I'm the biggest giver there is. And I'm like, I'm transparent and I'm always trying to help or figure out like to the point where I neglect myself. It took yeah. me until about two years ago to realize, no, you got to stop that. Like you got to, you, you got to put your that, mask on. No, but that's like our, our nature, like givers. Yeah. And so I want, I want young women to learn, like we really truly have to empower each other, you know, mm -hmm. coming up along the chain. I liked what you point out to jump back to, you know, it used to be, you could walk in any building in New York back in the day, hand your resume in, you know, there weren't all these security things go drop it. I was always dropping, you know, during college, I was dropping things off. I went to school here. Nobody ever stopped me or anything. And then you could be even like, you know, part-time receptionist, work your way. And I'm dating myself, but 
bear with me with this one. Yeah. And you could become like, you know, the secretary. Then somewhere yeah. along the way it became you're now the assistant and like mm -hmm. work up that chain, which you pointed out, which I think is, you know, it, it doesn't exist anymore. There's mm -hmm. no loyalty in the jobs. There's no 40 years you get the gold watch type of thing. Mm -hmm. There's none of that um, for our young people to see, which is why, again, I am so concerned they do need this path. I want more companies to mentor, truly. Yes. Like, do what you're doing. I don't understand, Kat, what's so hard for them to understand doing this. Because after all, our youth are our future, yes. right? Not only of society, of our entire country. And frankly, again, another program, our country is not doing so great right now with mm -hmm. all this going on. And we just can't stand for this because, you know, we love our country. And mm -hmm. so I'm trying to teach, you know, look, I'm just trying to get people even to go out, older people to vote. You know I mean? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's another one. Like, you know, I'm like, well, we have to try because there are women in other countries are not even allowed to vote. So yeah. no matter what you think, we have to at least get out there and exercise our right to vote. It's a very complicated um, issue. What do you, I'd like to also, I read, I think it, it must've been one of your Instagram postings recently. Like you like to do everything in person, which I love mm -hmm. to do. Like any business I do, like real, I like to look at people. <laughs> I like to just, I actually think it works much better in business that eye to eye contact in person kind of thing. Um, why do you like that so much? Because we've become this kind of online isolated type of a community, you know, in the United States. Because I spent my entire 20 year career working remotely outside of an office. <laughs> and so now you're like, can't get enough. You're like, bring it on. No, it's, it's actually, um, Part of part of that is I actually work better in a quiet environment. I'm on the spectrum. I I have autism, so being in a in an office is actually very difficult. I can't filter out right. everything. Um, so I did work better at home, and I was very. I a lot of people described me as somebody. If no, if anyone can make remote work feel like she's sitting right next to you, it's cat. Um, but from but when I was uh, remote working, I actually was able to connect with more people because I wasn't confined to the people in my office. Right. So I really, really enjoyed that. And now I have so many people coming at me from different places. It's very chaotic. It's not all in one chat. It's not all in one, you know, uh, corporate chat. And so I feel a loss of the ability to truly connect now. We all had one goal, all of these different people coming at me. We still had something connected on. Now we're all doing different things. And yeah. the the loss of the connection between people, um, even just the screens, interfere with how we think when we're too much in front of them. So I'd like meeting people. It's more about experiencing humans. If if my life had gone a different way, I most likely would have been a, a sociologist or an anthropologist, just studied people for the rest of my life. Really? So yeah, because we're fascinating. For uh, you, Whether you like somebody or not, whether you think they're good or bad, there's a whole backstory that made them the way that they are that you don't understand. And the, we, the way that we've, we're all really the same, we just have different experiences that allow us to become the way that we are. Our cultures, our, our ways of approaching things, humans are fascinating, including the ones that uh, I had a fascination growing up with serial killers and understanding what drives a person to do that. There was a wonderful book I, call, I read called I, um, Confessions of a Serial Killer, and he talks about the torture he went through. He didn't want to kill the women. And he was driven to. I was like, that is fascinating. That's fascinating. <laughs> it is. It's fascinating. I have to just stop you for a minute because my you're, now you're my husband's twin because like, he's, <laughs> no, he's fascinated with what makes people tick. Yeah. What and he'll always want to like, you know, look at YouTubes or documentaries about serial killers. And I'm like, this is really, this has been going on for decades, years. I'm yeah. Like, it's weird. But he's like, no, I want to make the, I want, I want to know what makes them like do this or you know why yeah. one does it and another doesn't. He's like, right. So I'm understanding everything you're saying because he's exactly like <sighs> that. I, um, I don't know. I, I don't I also, know. I'm, like I'm, on, like, I'm on one path to be like, empower our youth or something. As opposed to, you know, that's kind of like, 
I see. I'm 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 not a good person like you and my husband. I, if they're like <laughs> mean or something or a serial killer, I don't want to know about them. I'm, I'm like, no, I got to focus on the good ones so they don't become like a serial killer or some something. How it's fascinating what you're saying though. Yeah. How do you keep them from becoming serial killers if you don't understand what drives them? The serial killers, that is. So how do you prevent somebody from becoming? What if? What if somebody has a, na a nature aspect to it that would have grown up to be a serial killer and there's a way to nurture them out of it? I don't know. I, I like to focus more on just people in general, right. but include that includes serial killers and what makes them tick and why people are driven to be the way that they are. I have um, it's no secret now that I have a contentious relationship with Christina, my birth mother, and people s want me to be angry with her. They want me to be like mad in order for me not to talk to her. I'm not mad. I understand that she had a situation that made her the way that she was. She just has nothing for me. There is nothing for me in that relationship. I don't dislike her. I don't hate her. The true opposite of love is indifference. I have total indifference towards her, but I've also forgiven her for being the person that she is. Not necessarily totally forgiven her for everything that has resulted on me. I'm still working through that, but she didn't mean to be the way that she was. So good or bad, we all have reasons why we turn out the way that we do. And it's really fascinating to try and, and just get to understand people on, on their level, not on yours. And so I love to be able to meet with people and you get an opportunity to really get to know them, to hang out with them, to hear their stories. Everybody wants to ask me all questions about me. My life's been pretty cool. You can, any question you're going to answer, ask me is probably already out there on the internet somewhere because somebody's asked me. I want to know about you. I want to know about why you got this car and how it's driven you and the stories that you have. And I mean, people are just incredible. And we spend so much time judging others. Right. We forget how we, why are we watching so much Netflix and movies? People are these movies. Just go talk to humans. Yeah, right? no, I know. I, I, I agree. Um, I'm going to take back some of the things I said. Like I, I like to talk to people to find out about them. Yeah. And it's funny when people say like, you know, like, how'd you meet your husband or something like that? You know, I, I'm, I'm just using it as an example. I always turn it around because I'll be like, you know, oh, I want to know about you. I mean, yeah. It has to be your husband or or, or, or whatever, because I actually am kind of fascinated in what makes the people tick. But again, lately, I'm around a lot of our youth. So I'm really trying to, like, empower them to talk about, you know, their journeys or where they want to go or their dreams and things like that. And that's another thing. I work with a lot of parents or Families today are all different. You know, we have kids living with grandparents. We have all kinds of different kinds of families today. Okay. You can't, I'm very cautious about just saying parents all the time because mm -hmm. we have siblings raising, raising their siblings. You know, like I feel like it's my job, our job also to empower them to understand more, you mm -hmm. know, to take care of the younger ones. So I'm, I've been doing a lot of that because the kids are kind of knowing a lot of stuff, you know, yeah. again, before they should. So what do we do? We can't sweep that under the rug, right? It's reality. We have to deal with what's happening in the landscape today. I mean, right now, whether it's online, safety trafficking, I, I love that you're providing this pathway, you know, dreamers, you can do it. Um, I know also um, you just got back fairly recently. You were traveling again. Okay. Yeah. One of my dreams is really to get in an RV one day. I, I've been telling my husband this for, for years now. Travel. People will be like, don't you want to go to Europe? And I'm like, no. I want to get in an RV and travel across the United States and go to like towns we don't hear of or something. Yes. Meet yes. the local people. Mm -hmm. what, what's the local dish? Like what do people mm -hmm. eat? And just talk to the locals. Like yes. that is something I'm going to do yes. before I leave this earth. Because- that's what fascinates me because I really haven't been to a lot of states when I, you know, take into account, you know, sometimes I count up how many states have I been to? 
why don't call, you know, 28 states enough, you know, when we have all, all these other places. No, I want to go to these other places, not just always, you know, Miami or whatever these places are that everybody goes to um, kind of thing. But that is a dream of mine, just to meet the locals, the people, how do they live, what's going on. Um, we That's forget. Cause, no, because well, I'm in New York City, so we forget. And I'm in California a lot. It's very different, California, New York, from a lot of those other states. Where everywhere people, else. Everywhere. <laughs> Literally <laughs> everywhere else. <laughs> exactly. So, like, I'm, I'm so conditioned. Um, but what did you find on your recent trip, your travels? It looked like you were having a great time. It looked like you were getting uh, empowered all over the place. Yes. Smiling all over the place. I loved it. <laughs> What'd you learn? What'd you find out? Uh, well, we, we had, first of all, proudest day of my life. One of them was when my young daughter looked at me and said, mom, how many states have we not been to? Oh, yes. Cause road trips were a thing. I took my kids across mm -hmm. all of the United States. I think mm -hmm. when she asked me that question, there was 13. Um, and most of them were new England, which is where we live now. So we've checked them all off the book, right. but, uh, but, but that's actually where, where, where we're going next. So it's a perfect segue into what we just did and where we're going next. Um, we had an opportunity to actually drive. So one of the cars we're building is fully engineered bespoke car. The other one um, is to honor my dad. So my dad wanted to build a car on the mid-engine Corvette platform. That's what the DMC-12 was supposed to be built on. He, GM wouldn't sell him the engineering for it. So he went whatever route he went to build the car he did. And when General Motors came out with the mid-engine Corvette, my husband and I were researching things in my father's legacy. And I looked at him and I said, you mean to tell me my dad wanted to build a car on this car and we're building a car and they just came out with that car? That was the words. I'm not always as eloquent as I am right now. <laughs> okay. and, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. <laughs> wow. So yeah. I, was, I was blown away. So I said, we have to figure out how to build my dad his car. <clears throat> so we've, we've partnered with a, a, a well-established aftermarket performance builder. And we're going to be building um, our car on a C8 platform. And so it was fitting that we got to actually drive one for 2,500 plus miles to go from Miami to F1, which was just this incredible trip. And uh, Jason and I got some time alone in a road trip, which was just amazing. We got um, time to experience the car, understand what we like, what we didn't, what we want to change, um, and all of those things. So it was a really wonderful trip. I also got to spend my birthday having a private part, not for me, but I was, we had a private party and private tour on the Hoover Dam, which is bananas. You were like all over the place. Oh yeah. Birthday. Thank you. Thank but you. Also you had like your date time in the middle of, it was like date time, right? Like also. Yeah. It, it was, yeah. You're out of your regular environment. What could be better? I call it date time. Okay, yeah, like, you know, that's so what it was, which is creative yeah. when you can explore, you're not, you know, you're not at home worried about, I don't know, vacuuming or, or whatever yes. goes on, your laundry, you can talk and drive and put music on or whatever you want to do. I, we have our best dates, my husband and I in the car. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> it, those it, are our only dates come to think like when we're driving, you know, because we're so busy all the time. So tell us about the Hoover Dam. So tell that the I Hoover Dam there. Was the Hoover Dam was amazing. We, uh, the guy told us in 21 years he's worked there, he's never seen somebody park a car on top of the dam, have dinner on top of the dam, or be there past five o'clock. And we got to do all of those things. Wow. It was incredible. And we own a little hydro station in New Hampshire. So for me, one of the people who went with us said, that was really cool. But I had a such a good time because I just kept watching you. Because the whole time I was with my face, like my jaw on the floor. It was phenomenal. And so that's what we got to do on my birthday, which was incredible. Um, and, and it really just kind of reignited my wanderlust. Since I was small, when I was little, I would sleep in New Jersey and I would think I wanted an RV and I wanted to travel all around the country and do what you do, just meet you're, people. You're just copying me because I used to yeah. say growing up in New Jersey too. <laughs> See, it's a New Jersey thing. It's and a then New I was Jersey like, kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. And and I even thought to myself, if I wanted to travel to Europe, I actually wanted a boat big enough. I didn't want to fly. I wanted a boat big enough for my RV so I could just drive my RV in Europe. Really? I, I never yeah. went that far, Kat. I never got that far. 
with the boat. Okay? Yeah, but but I just wanted to drive around. So now we have this this um, opportunity where uh, I've always wanted to do this thing called dining with DeLoreans. I have been invited to have regional dinner with people in all over the world. And I said to Jason, we should do a YouTube show where I go and do this. Yes. We did our first one when we were in Arizona. I got to meet with a fan, but I want to go to their house and meet them and hear their stories and eat regional food. And it fits with what we're doing because we also have to travel around and see these factory towns. We're working to revitalize the factory towns. We're working to really help the places that have been hurt most first. So part of what we want to do, I said, I want to be the ice cream truck of hope. I want everybody to see our school, our schoolie coming in and they get really excited because DNG is here to help. I so I want to convert a, a school bus, which is fitting, and make our, our make an RV that we can use to actually travel uh, across the country and meet all the people where engineers will be, the towns that want to have us there. Um, and we actually have a proposal already from someone for a limited series for this. I so like it. it looks like that might actually happen. And oh, good. Yeah. it. It feels like my dream is now coming true because I get to do that. I get to go meet real people in real America. We have, it's, we as Americans don't appreciate the different countries we have within our states. Yes. We have so many different cultures that exist within our states and we kind of take it for granted because it's not, we don't have to use passports to get there. But I've lived in many different cultures in the United States, and they're very different. They have their own dialects, they have their own food, they have their own uh, traditions. Even calling the same thing something else and like mischief night versus devil's night for the night before Halloween. We have all these micro cultures in our over overarching United States culture. Right. And I want to learn about all of them. I want to learn about what they do for fun. I just got to play cornhole for the first time in my life not too long ago. Everybody plays cornhole, but I'd never done it. It wasn't part of my growing up culture. So I got to play it. Let's, you know, that kind of stuff. I, you know, I didn't know this cornhole thing has really taken off. Yeah, I, <laughs> apparently. I, I, didn't, uh, I, I didn't know either, but uh, fairly recently, you know, uh, I was at a, I was attending a wedding and they had as part, <laughs> of their, part of their cocktail hour. They had like cornhole. <laughs> The bride and the groom, they had like some games set up on the patio and it's like cornhole. And ever since then, it's like cornholes all around me. Yeah. Every, like, I didn't ever play cornhole growing up in New Jersey. I, I mean, and I'm, I'm a lot older than you, but like, <laughs> I don't know about this cornhole thing, but it's a bit, it's a bit, no, but I like, but here's the thing, Kat, you have this, um, and I've said this to you before, like this infectious energy and passion I am telling you that is what is needed to rub off on other people. Mm -hmm. That is to me, like one of your biggest gifts in addition to all this wonderful work, like people need this infectious energy. Just when you sit there and smile and I'm not kidding, like, Oh, it makes me so happy. Thank you. <laughs> because, yeah. Yeah, because things are so dire and people are so like miserable or people just want to complain all the time. And we can't do that. We have to No, we're so lucky for anything we have. If we have a roof over our heads, if we eat every day, if our, our health, like we're just so lucky in those things that everybody forgets about. Mm -hmm. And so this infectious energy and what you're doing is completely just so needed and so beautiful. Uh, give us some final thoughts. What do you want to leave whether it's youth, whether it's all people, what do you want to leave us with right now? Because it sounds like you are on a roll and I love it uh, doing all these projects. I, I know things are, I, I know it, I can feel it, are just going to really keep exploding for you. I feel it. And what do you want to leave with people listening, watching to us, you know, watching us? I suppose first I should tell them how they can find me because I didn't put it on my thing. Yeah. So if you well, want, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna fill okay. all that in. Uh, the, okay, but cool. I no, but tell, so, tell us the best best way because I said DeLoreanNextGen.com for that mm -hmm. website. What and there's your Instagram, Cat DeLorean. Instagram is, is your where best you way. Yeah, because it's easier for me to interact with you there. I am available on Facebook as well. It's a lot harder to manage that, so it'll take me longer to get back to you. But um, if you send me a DM, I will respond. It's 
it takes a while, but it's something that I, I love. No, you're, to good do. On, you're good on the Instagram. You're like, you put it all out there. It's like, I see you're like active on that, but those are, that's really the best, right? Like Instagram and the website. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. But yes. But what I want to leave, uh, what I want to leave, um, children, like our next generation with is it's not you. The rules have changed and nobody has really given you a new playbook. That makes sense. Here's the thing. The next generation that's coming up has more empathy than any prior generation ever. There is a greater desire in our youth to work together and to change things for the better than in any prior generation I've been able to witness or truly understand. We're figuring out the way to get you to that hope to that end, what the new formula is. Until then, find somebody you can just talk to about the weather. Get yourself a single person. Everybody only needs one. And be that person for somebody else. Say, hey, if you're having a hard time, I'll put you on my emergency exception list. And if you want to call me at three in the morning and just talk about dogs, let's do it. Be somebody who can just be there. And if you have an opportunity, a skill, a way that you can help somebody in a small way, do it. You could change their entire world forever. We are all struggling. We're all scared. We all have no playbooks anymore. It's not just you, but it's okay because we're working on it. Just remember, you have the power to be happy if you decide. That's hard but try it and don't let anybody else have the power over you to take that away. Find a friend. Thanks Kat. Cause now I have tears in my eyes and <laughs> I've got that little thing in my throat that <laughs> <clears throat> chokes me up because, you know, I do a lot with youth with the suicide prevention mm -hmm. and all of that. And one of the things which you just said is it's like, be there. You know, I give out the little tips, be there and follow up. Not, mm -hmm. not just how are you once like you have to be there always follow up kind of thing. So thank you um, for those wonderful words. You know, I just want to finish off a quote of yours. Uh, I just think it's so beautiful. You know, we are here to offer a pathway for dreamers on both sides to come together and create something that could not exist in solitude, a machine of forward momentum that drives us into the future. I, I think that says so much. And Kat DeLorean, I am just so honored that we've started, you know, speaking together, you know, thank you for taking the time today. Thank you for joining me. Thank you again for spreading this passion. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so, I can't, I have to keep saying it because I don't come across it really. Like it's so infectious. Also, you know, sharing also your dad's journey and filling us in to the truths about that and keeping his legacy alive and moving it forward, I think is so exciting. And we need, we need so much more of this uh, in today's world. And you are, beyond a doubt, a top warrior. I, I, I use the word warrior. Like we No, we, it works. Like I, that was never even a word in my vocabulary till I sat up one day and said to my husband, I'm becoming a warrior. Like we are good warriors. We are warriors for hope. We're warriors for dreaming, fighting for good kind of thing. Um, and I have my, to just say, you know, you're a warrior. My, my favorite book, and I do recommend this to everybody, it's a movie too, but don't watch the movie, read the book. Um, it's called Way of the Peaceful Warrior. And so I have, I, I spent this past year has been my internal peaceful warrior journey. If you read the book, you'll understand it's, it's about enlightenment and letting go and things like that. So calling me a warrior is an honor because I worked very, very, very hard to find my inner peaceful warrior. It's about being a peaceful warrior is about fighting for justice and still having peace. You can do that. So it's an appropriate word. I appreciate okay. it. Thank you. Okay, good. Because I use it in the highest sense of the word. We are good warriors and you're That's the best. Um, Kat, to you, Jason, your beautiful family, have a wonderful holiday season. Everything is going along so well. I am so happy for you. I want to speak to you again soon. We have to keep sure. on this. We have to keep letting people, the public know what is going on. We have to get them involved 
to participate. <laughs> Again, uh, DeLoreanNextGen.com. Everybody can go to that website and follow Kat DeLorean on Instagram. Kat, thank you so much. We will definitely speak again soon. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye-bye.